are live in YouTube. We're live in YouTube. Okay, you guys want me to go ahead and begin? No, 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 not yet. I'll, we are just live in YouTube. Now at 5 p.m. in one more minute, I'm gonna go ahead and get us uh, live in the broadcast to, okay. to start the Zoom and get the people coming in. So we'll start off with a little music and then uh, Toba will I, introduce you guys. I, and then we'll Actually, I don't, have, I don't have any music today because I'm, I'm in the office. I'm not ah, in, okay. the, in the house. Hey, um, Heather, why don't you, I'll introduce Dr. Curry and how about you introduce Travis? How about that? Does that uh, sound okay. like a good idea? Okay, sure. perfect. I'm, I'm having some technical difficulties because I'm joining from a different computer. So um, if that works for you. Okay, we anytime now, one more minute. Perfect. All right. Well, Dr. Curry, thanks for doing this for us. I appreciate oh. it. Nice to meet you. Likewise, and uh, um, thank you. Thank you for the, the invitation. Um, sounds like a cool little symposium you guys got going. I actually knew nothing about it until I, I looked it up recently and saw all the cool topics you guys have done. So sounds really neat. Yeah. Well, your, you your, your uh, compadre, uh, Bill Whitehead, helped us last month. So it's yeah. been, yeah, it's been really great. Great been really great. Ignacio, have you, are you, let us know when we're ready, I guess. Yeah, I'm waiting for five. We still got a few seconds. No problem. Okay. Five PM on the dot, like right now. We are ready in five, four, three, two. We are live. Let me know when you guys want me to go right in. Sounds good. What I'll do is I'll introduce you guys and then um, you can go ahead and start. So I'll give you that cue. We're going to let enough people join in um, and then we'll kind of go from there. Oh, well, my mom's logging on, so we can't start till she logs on. <laughs> Sounds good. And I'm going to go to a more mobile platform after my introduction. And Sounds continue good. Continue on because, of course, I've got a case because doesn't everybody always have a case? No problem. Dan, how, how close are you guys to, to um, installation? It's installed. Um, it's, we visited it the other day and uh, admired it from afar. Um, hopefully we'll be doing the uh, uh, QA soon. I think it's, I think that, I think it's scheduled for August. Is there going to start? Use some essential trimmer cases? The uh, essential trimmer, yeah, that's going to be the main of course, focus in the beginning, but hopefully we'll be, you know, um, you know, in concert with, with, with uh, these folks doing some HHs relatively soon. I haven't hung a shingle about it yet. Good. Only because um, of the IRB issues. Uh, but once that gets set, I can speak freely in clinic. And I think once, once that happens, there's going to be a number of uh, candidates. If you want to get the team up and running on a few, uh, I got a bunch of people from Texas that don't need to come to Nebraska. So we can we can do some thalamotomies just to warm everybody up. Great, Samir would be very interested in that. 
All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I wanted to welcome everybody to our monthly um, Miami Pediatric Neurosurgery Symposium. Uh, today, I have the um, really honor of introducing uh, Dr. Daniel Curry, who is the Director of Functional Neurosurgery and Epilepsy Surgery and the John S. Dunn Foundation Endowed Chair for Minimally Invasive Epilepsy Surgery, um, as well as Professor at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, today, um, he's going to give us a little bit of introduction, and we're going to um, speak further on MR-focused ultrasound for pediatric patients. Um, and then, Heather, uh, why don't you let us know who the second speaker is? Yep. Um, and I'd like to introduce Travis Tierney, who will be speaking uh, second. He's professor of brain sciences at Imperial College London, and uh, MR-focused ultrasound is really a passion of his, so I think it'll be exciting to hear uh, his talk as well. And then uh, we hope all of you will um, add your questions on the chat uh, portion, uh, so that we can ask them at the end uh, of both speakers and have a nice discussion today. All right. Okay. Thank you. So go ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and uh, do an introduction. Um, so I, um, I was asked uh, by the group, and, and thank you very much for the, the in, invitation, um, and, and by Travis as well, to uh, kind of give some context and some introduction to the concept of focus ultrasound in the pediatric population, but ironically, I'm giving it to the one place that has done it. So uh, my, my main uh, disclosure here is not that I'm a consultant for Med Medtronic, it's just I haven't done this yet. Um, I have, uh, we have got the device. Um, we are, in, and we are finished the installation. I have done some training, but I have yet to get my anxious hands on a uh, focus ultrasound machine to apply it to the uh, deep minimum invasive targets um, that I've uh, focused my, my career on. So in, so a lot of this introduction is really putting it in the context of where it can go from my point of view. So I don't need to tell this group much about it in the sense that you know it's a minimally invasive incisionless surgical intervention that thermally ablates small targets deep in the brain. And I think Travis is gonna go over some of the technical aspects that make it a deep target and not necessarily a peripheral target, but if the peripheral targets do open up, there's going to be many, many applications. Uh, it is FDA cleared for VAM thalamotomy and essential tremor and some tr uh, tremor uh, dominant Parkinson's disease in the adult world, but there's no FDA cleared indication in children, which is what the uh, focus of this will be. So what are the possible uses of this device? Well, really it's kind of endless for a functional neurosurgeon, but uh, in my world, in the epilepsy world, I can think of three deep targets. Um, hypothalamic hematoma is of course where I would go first and where you guys have gone first. Um, but I think a lot needs to be done there as far as, you know, which lesions to go after, how to strategize um, your targeting. Uh, there's a whole lot of work there. Uh, periventricular nodular heterotopia is, a, is another big world. And one thing that people don't, that epilepsy surgeons forget is that the mesial temporal lobe epilepsy or the uh, amygdalo hippocampal complex is really a deep target. So if we can get the focused ultrasound to be therapeutic in that range, a massive amount of epilepsy will open it up. Now, the oncology issue <clears throat> is, of course, self-evident. I think it just is going to require someone, um, probably a <clears throat> sacrificial assistant professorship somewhere <laughs> to, devent, to, to uh, devote their career uh, to getting the children's oncology group protocol designed to get this done. Focused, I mean, a uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, 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 laser ablation, something I've Put my career on has been talking about this for 10 years, but there's been no one out there that has decided to really make that cog protocol something everyone can get their brain around. So once, once that's done, I think the oncology indications here will open up, not just for the primary tumors, as I mentioned here, but also for METs. Um, so the movement disorder world in pediatrics is not quite as tidy as in the adult world, and it's focused applications, but there are some pallidotomies that are done occasionally, uh, secondarily. There's a, the, the very, very rare VIM uh, th thalamotomy. But I think one area is very interest, or uh, very much interesting in the world of pediatrics is more of a, um, a um, cerebellar tremor, Holmes tremor, and action tremor world for which the posterior subthalamic area has become an emerging target in pediatrics will thalamotomy there be effective. I think that would be an interesting study to look at here. And of course, in, in a world that I'm now diving um, 
headfirst into in drug and gene delivery, opening up the blood brain barrier is going to be an important piece of this tool. I know my oncologists are very interested in the notion, but as I um, dive into gene therapy and gene delivery in pediatrics, we realize we can only on a great day get, you know, 10, 20% of the genes we need in the brain. If we can open up the blood brain barrier and widen the gene delivery with this tool, it will be an immense uh, task to accomplish. This mental invasive epilepsy surgeon, of course, is, one, is, is, is focusing on hypothalamic hematoma and its applications here would be not just the epilepsy cure, but the palliation of epileptic encephalopathy, which is a unique indication in pediatrics. You know, maybe there's a goal, a role for rage attacks here that the, the, <clears throat> the uh, uh, physiology of that has to be worked out, but I, I do see that um, the Miami group has focused one of their treatments on the obesity issue here, which I think is fascinating. So if we can do that and with the rage attacks in HH, it would be huge. And of course, the complication avoidance is always a big deal here. The goals could be either surgical destruction on a small one or disconnection on the large one or even the staged approach. Um, and this is a huge armamentarium that is approached here, but they're all relatively morbid comparatively. So decreasing the, the, the morbidity here is going to be a very important step forward. Um, so what can it do? It can decrease the corridor related mor morbidity, to, to morbidity to virtually zero. Should improve the safety profile, although a lot has to be taken into account there with the premature head. There may be non-thermal mechanisms here that are going to be at play and need to be studied. And is this an actual outpatient sort of approach in epilepsy surgery in PEDS? You know, other than VNS, we don't have one. So what are the challenges? Well, we got a dose in the immature cranium because we know every intervention that we do is better earlier. So we can't wait for the maturity of the skull. So we've got to work out the science here. Uh, the dosing of the fluid interfaces is going to be a big deal because not as opposed to the isothermic thalamus, we're in a very complicated microthermodynamic world where ultrasound could have all sorts of interaction, interactions that we're going to need to know something about. Can it be accurate down to the millimeter? These things are right up against your mammillary bodies. Um, <clears throat> lesion size versus ablation volume is going to be a big deal. Um, are we back to the RF days in which radiofrequency ablation failed to take off in epilepsy surgery because we simply couldn't make the ablation volume big enough or practical enough. Um, we're gonna to have to refine our disconnection strategies if that's the focus that we're going to go down. And my biggest worry here, and I need to sort this out once I get my hands on it, is just where is the highest error in this machine? It, it seems to be, from since it's a top-down approach, the highest error is where you don't want to be inaccurate. And that is in the base of the brain where the mammillary bodies are, if you're focusing on the, hypo, uh, the hypothalamic uh, hematomas. So there, are, there is one very interesting paper that has been uh, sort of, I'm sure Travis is going to mention this, where they decided to do a disconnective strategy with the Japanese group here. And you hear they're, they've, they've done a DTI and focusing on one area. And this is the size of the ablation that they did, this tiny little ablation here and this solved the gelastic epilepsy problem. I must say I'm skeptical uh, uh, that, 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 they, that they, they got the one fiber um, that was connecting it. Um, this is a very fascinating uh, paper and the outcome, but much more needs to be studied here because if this is the way to go, there are plenty of these that need to be done in this manner. But I think we need to sort out what our connection and disconnection strategies are going to be. And of course, of course, every time I talk about any thermal ablation in the hypothalamus, I always give this cautionary tale of trusting a technology too early, too much. This is a, a complication I had early on in the laser ablation days where the one millimeter drop off was believed. And, you know, we got to the other side and we caused a bilateral mam uh, a mammillary body injury that was published. Um, causing a significant deficit. So be respectful of the new te technology, but I think there's no need to be too timid here. I think it, there's a plenty to do. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Travis. Um, just as, a, as a, an aside, he and I have been, he's been a great advisor in our um, development 
of our HIFU program here and hopefully we'll get off the ground in the fall. Um, he has a, um, a stellar and bulletproof pedigree for someone who's approaching this. He's a Oxford brain, scien uh, brain scientist that uh, went to medical school at, 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 at um, Hopkins. He residency at, M at MGH, did fellowships in, at your esteemed center and at Toronto at the, uh, at the uh, Valhalla of uh, functional neurosurgeon. So if there's anyone that has the training to push this um, tool into the pediatric functional realm, it is Travis. So I will turn it over to, to him now. Thanks, Dan, for that kind introduction. And, and, and Toba and, and um, Dr. Nelson and Heather McRae for um, introducing me and welcoming me back um, to Miami. I came back here to give this talk um, for a couple of reasons. I miss this place a lot. Um, I think this symposium is a direct extension of why uh, Miami Children's Hospital, namely Variety Hospital, is such a great institution. Um, a fellow named uh, Dr. Altman in the 1960s started something called the Pediatric Board Reviews here and the whole world came and they sat here for 10 days and they, they learned their, their Pediatric Board Reviews and then they went home and um, it ended up bringing a lot of notoriety to this place. And what I realized about Miami Children's while I was here was that this is one of the greatest teaching institutions that I've ever had the pleasure of, um, of training in. So uh, thank you, Heather, and, and, and thank you, um, Toba, for, for training me. Um, Dan Curry is the greatest enemy non-combatant you could ever have the pleasure of knowing um, and with enemy non-combatants like Dan, you don't need friends because his reviews, at least the review I think I read, was just stellar and has helped us think about how to put these ideas together in ways that make sense um, for everybody. Uh, Dan worries about things that are theoretical, but he's practical enough to know where the trouble is. So Dan, I mean, You've really guided me in my thinking over the time that we've been putting putting these um, ideas together. So today I want to spend a little bit of time giving everybody a real practical feeling for what it means to do focused ultrasound, not just in kids, but there is a focus on kids for sure, because that's what we're really interested in. Uh, but to take some of the lessons um, that we learned in doing focused ultrasound in adults and applying those to the, the pediatric realm. Can everybody see my screen? Is it being shared? We can see it. All right. It's not on the projection mode though. Yes, okay. go to the, on the bottom, there you go. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Now we can see it perfectly, Dr. P. So focus ultrasound, adult lessons for kids. I didn't really mean to make that sound so racy, but we made mistakes as we went along. And the folks who made the best mistakes were the world's greatest experts, the stereotactic and functional neurosurgeons, uh, because we depended upon our theoretical understanding of what was going on in the thalamus, and that led us astray. So we don't want to make those mistakes in kids. I want to talk about three theoretical concepts and three practical principles um, before we even talk about any data. I'll talk about all the on-label stuff that we learned in adults when we did the essential tremor trial, and then briefly touch on the rationale for pediatric focused ultrasound. And that has something very strongly to do with non-ionizing radiation. I'm only going to talk about two cases today. Um, I'm going to talk about one home run, which is indeed an interesting case. Uh, and the most important case, which is the strikeout case. And that's really the one to pay attention to because that lets you know what the machine might not be able to do. And you can help me think of ways around that. There are some directions that um, I have biases towards in, in pediatric um, uh, applications for focus ultrasound that have to do with uh, movement disorders. And Dan touched upon a number of those already in better detail than I'll describe. But um, I think that pediatric dystonia and bilateral palatotomies is possible. So we won't have to implant these kids with these, these one, one girl that Toba and I did, she called it her baby for a couple of years because the battery was so big in her belly. And uh, it, it is a disfiguring operation in children. Uh, DBS. So there may be ways, ways around that. 
For those of you who are not aficionados, this is the Insight Tech uh, 4000 device. It's the only FDA approved device. I'll say right up front, I don't, I didn't put up any disclosures because unlike Dan, I've, I've had a problem developing um, uh, certain disclosures. Not, not that I don't want them. It's just um, nobody's willing to pay me large amounts of money to, 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 to talk or do research for them. But um, Insight Tech has been supportive in a number of ways that have been non, non-financial. Um, they have a very excellent regulatory division. And uh, we got through the FDA in 30 days on a, on a pediatric brain tumor trial. That does speak to the facility with which the regulatory division at Insight Tech interfaces well with the um, FDA. So kudos to them there though, but they are nonetheless a commercial company and I've never taken a dime from them, but they've got a nice product. First designed in the Brigham and Women's Hospital and templated and made real in uh, Israel at the Technion by some steely-eyed missile men. It consists mostly of a helmet, a computer, and what I call the water cooler here. This water cooler pumps water into the helmet, which acoustically couples the piezoelectric drivers, which are simply speakers, to the, to the scalp. If you take the hood off this thing, this, it costs as much as a Ferrari. So it actually costs more than a few Ferraris. Um, you can see the back of it here. And what this is, is there's a thousand piezoelectric drivers all aimed at one central spot right here in the middle, just like a gamma knife. And Inside Tech would have you believe that the thermal dose fall off is as sharp as this pin looking thing here. And indeed it is. This is a H&E section from one of Jeff Elias's papers that shows coagulated brain separated by roughly 100 to 50 microns from normal brain. And I'm here to tell you it is that sharp in this plane, in the axial plane. What's going on in the SI plane? I think Dan talked a lot about that. What happens in the far field down here? We've got some evidence that things do happen and I'll touch on that in a minute. I wanna to touch on the, on the concept of um, electrical focusing because that's really critical for understanding how to use this device. You don't have to move this array around. You can use a computer to do it. And the guy who came up with this idea of the steerable phased array was a very interesting man named Frank Yoles who died a couple of years ago. The way that focus ultrasound was done, beginning with Lars Lexell, by the way, um, Lexell decided that there, weren't in, there wasn't enough computer control to control sound waves. So he moved on to radiation, which he thought was a lot easier to work with. And hence Gamma Knife was born, but he was one of the first. And then the Fry brothers in in the United States here, use parabolic arc reflectors, which had a fixed focal point, a really elegant way to do this, vibrating at ultrasonic frequencies, and they could heat up that little point. That works really well for the body system where you don't have a lot of bone to go through. And that is the basis of the current body system, which is available commercially. Frank Yola has predicted that to have a enough energy to get through the skull though, you would need a parabolic arc reflector that's about 10 meters across. So that made that a little bit impractical. And what he did was to use his engineering background to break this thing up physically and electrically into a whole bunch of little pieces. He put it in a dome and then he ran wires in the back and he could control the incident sound waves. This thing here does not take into consideration what's called deconstructive interference, where one of these signals will hit another one over here and cancel it out. But Frank's system did. He can make sure that all of those incident sound waves line up right here with constructive interference. But even more importantly, and the most important practical thing here is you can steer this around just with a computer. I don't understand the physics of it or anything like that. But what I know is you don't want to move a brain when you need submillimeter accuracy or the phased array that's around it. You wanna move that just electronically in, in non-solid state with just digital movements. And that's what we do when we do VIM thalamotomies. This stuff got us in trouble. This is a theoretical idea that came from cats in the 50s and 60s and some pretty famous uh, studies done by Rank and others like that, that showed that neurons stop firing at 42 degrees. And that is indeed true. Proteins start to denature at 43 degrees Celsius. Uh, there's a time dependency to 
uh, thermocoagulation. So if you keep stick around there for a little while, you're, you're going to eventually kill the tissue, but you won't kill it right away. This number is worth tucking into your brain, 54 degrees. That is indeed, at least in gray matter, 54 degrees is instantaneous uh, coagulative necrosis. The tissue's dead. So if you hit 54 degrees, you're good. But you don't want to go too hot because over 60 degrees, you get what's called inertial cavitation, which is what happens in submarines. Uh, the little bubbles at the base of the submarine um, um, uh, tail, the, what's that thing that spins around in the back? Um, well, the reason this is so studied there is because it makes noise. And that noise was detectable and physicists for obvious reasons studied that. That's boiling. So this actually happens within the brain as well. So you wanna stay under 60 degrees to avoid the concept of inertial cavitation. And I'll show you where we got in trouble with that too once. This idea here below 50 degrees was in theory put forward during the essential tremor trial to suggest that we could map ventral caudalis, right? We can stimulate ventral caudalis at low energy and get thumb numbness, just like we do with DBS, and then go four millimeters anteriorly and zap it. That was a bad idea. That led to a lot of paresthesias. So um, whoever said to map, and I do know who it is, ventral caudalis was wrong. And you don't do things like that based upon theoretical principles, especially when you start realizing you're having permanent paresthesias. 54 degrees, 60 degrees. Those are the key critical things to just keep in mind. There are some interesting things about the pediatric skull that are important from a real practical point of view. The pediatric skull gets to its adult size roughly at age seven or eight. Uh, that may or may not be why that's the lower cutoff for DBS. I'm not sure, but that was the lower cutoff for our trial was eight years old. And that's because the incident angle changes. When you get above a, a, an angle of 25 degrees, the sound tends to bounce off the skull and back out into the world. So it's like looking in a pool. If you're above the incident angle, you can't see through it. Um, and small skulls have high incident angles and do not transmit sound well. But that's not the end all be all. There's also a problem within the skull itself. It's called the diploic space, which is full of fat. And um, we had to figure out why certain people with fatty skulls didn't do so well. So we came up with this idea of the, it's not really important to remember this, but it's called the skull density ratio. And if you ever do focused ultrasound, that'll be the number you're keyed into all the time. The FDA cutoff is 0.4. It goes from zero, which is the skull density ratio of um, sort of styrofoam stuck in oil to one, which is a skull density of marble. Um, I'm pretty happy when I see an SDR 0.45 or above. I'm ecstatic when it's 0.6 or 0.65. Um, I have noticed, though, on the super high density skulls that we tend to get a pinpoint uh, lesion in VIM, and I got to move it around. So there's something that's beyond optimal um, called a U curve. So somewhere around 0.6 for a skull density ratio is good. And as long as you're operating on humans that are adults, you don't got to worry about this incident angle stuff, but we're going to have to think about this as we get under age eight. Those are some nice practical principles, but this, if there's anything you want to remember at all from this talk, um, it would be this slide. And I think Dan Curry was talking a lot about this. This is currently the um, acoustic thermo envelope of the 650 kilohertz device that's FDA approved. And I think you can see why the functional neurosurgeons like that. There's STN right there. The pallidum is up here a little bit. The, the thalamus is just above this structure. And even the medial heads of the hippocampi work its way towards the um, edges of the 650 kilohertz device. When you drop the um, the uh, fre frequency to 220 kilohertz, you can reach more of the brain and still hit that magic 54 degrees. Um, and this clearly in the 220 kilohertz device can reach out to the corpus callosum and out to the hippocampal head. So the epilepsy surgeons start to get interested in that. But the first trial that was 
proposed used the 650 kilohertz device that was Vibor Krishna's trial at the University of um, Ohio State. And uh, the current trial in the United States, which I'm not a part of, uses the 650 kilohertz device, I think, as well. So everybody out there thinking about buying the 220 kilohertz device and who have been encouraged to think about that by Insight Tech, give me a call. I don't think you're going to need that device. These are basically the same uh, helmet with slightly different um, uh, tuning, as it were. They're both Lamborghinis, but they're tuned in different ways. So you don't want to pay $2 million twice. Um, there is a way to reach the entire neuroaxis and maybe even the spine. Um, the spine guys here asked me that a bunch of times. Can you get to the spine? Um, nope, not really that interested in the spine, but I can tell you if we use something called uh, histotripsy, which is like lithotripsy, so ultrasound guided ultrasonic histotripsy um, will allow you to get virtually anywhere in the neuroaxis and it makes a lesion within microseconds rather than seconds. So we won't need the Lexel frame. Um, we'll just have to worry about bleeding a little bit more, I think, than we have with um, thermal ablation. But the key take home message is we're here stuck in the middle at the moment and we're, we're working our way out with physics and eventually we'll get all the way out to the cortical surface. I think with no problem and maybe even for vascular lesions. But this is where it all started. Um, it wasn't my idea. It was Jeff Elias's idea. And it was a really good idea because treating essential tremor has um, an obvious uh, uh, end point. The tremor goes away right there on the table, right? And it was a beautiful outcome. Frank Yola has actually started with tumors and that was a disaster because he had to figure out if it actually did anything. And all those guys doing tumors, they don't have a really hard endpoint to really watch right now. So I'm, I'm really proud of what Jeff Elias did and thought about and how he did those trials because it was an absolute pleasure um, to work with him. And um, he asked me to be a part of that. And I learned a lot along the way. I didn't even know how to do a thalamotomy, even though I was from Toronto, right? Um, I had to learn how to do this myself. In fact, when Toronto tried to teach me how to do it, I realized that I wasn't doing a very good job because I was trying to do 60 degrees for 60 seconds, just like Andres told me in the thalamus. And that was too much. And my first patient really got off the table pretty wobbly. So we all went through a learning curve and that learning curve is now published. Um, so all the stereotactic aficionados are out there saying that focused ultrasound isn't this or isn't that versus DBS. The, thing, the key thing to look at there is the recent St. Jude's trial where the best stereotactic functional neurosurgeons in the world uh, helped St. Jude get their FDA approval for uh, tremor. They showed an overall 67% rate of tremor reduction. I was really depressed when our paper came out in the New England Journal with barely a 50% tremor suppression. Here, look at that. So. What I thought when I did DBS, it'd be 100%. I mean, that's what I thought. Um, but very rarely do we get that. Look, we had some really bad things. I mean, we didn't get any help down here. This happens to be the folks who are from Seoul, South Korea. And that's where the aegis of the, the, the understanding, rather, of the uh, skull density ratio come, came from. Jean Wu Chang worked that out. He didn't know why it wasn't working in his patients. They're relatively brachycephalic. Um, folks in Asia might just say we're relatively scaphocephalic, but the incident angle was smaller indeed in, in the Asian population. So they tended to strike out a little bit more. And that explained a lot of this stuff here. So Zhang Wu Chang put that together. He established the concept of only operate above a skull density ratio of 0.4 and you're gonna be fine. Remember, this was the first time through the forest here, these 76 patients. So when I operate on these patients, I tend to think I'm still at 100%. I know I'm not, but I'll, I'm, I can tell you that I've become as good a thalamotomy maker as I was a DBS um, installer. Um, and you can say what you will about that, but my, my efficacy rate is the same. And I think that the, um, the durability of the thalamotomy um, is the same as for DBS. So all this stuff that's out there in the literature 
could be settled with a head-to-head -head that people says can't be done. And I'm here to tell you, yes, it can be. My patients, if I ask them to do DBS, will do DBS if I ask. If they want to do a thalamotomy, and they all do, um, they will. But I'm pretty sure that we could think about a randomized trial, but nobody believes that, although I do. And that's just because I do the most focused ultrasound folks in the world. So I don't believe some of the things that have been said in the, even in the open literature, I certainly don't believe some of the things that are being said at, at meetings, but I do believe the data that Jeff showed us. Look at that. If you didn't get energy here, you didn't get an effect. If you got energy, you, you got your tremor reduced and it was relatively stable out through a year. Now we got three and five year follow-up data. A thalamotomy is a thalamotomy. If it's done well, it's durable. If you don't do it well, it's not durable. You gotta go back and do it again, but that's the beauty of focus ultrasound. I've got a 6% strikeout rate where it comes back at the end of six weeks because I missed, but I take them back and I do it again, you know, and I've got a 0% bleed rate and a 0% infection rate versus a 4% infection rate with DBS and a half a percent risk of bleed that's symptomatic with DBS. So in my mind, I don't know how we can go with something that's as effective as focus ultrasound with much safer safety margins compared to DBS. I don't understand the controversy, but I, I'd like to have somebody challenge me at the end. At any rate, this is what, this is really important. The New England Journal paper described what patients thought about and what neurologists thought about the, um, the uh, outcome, not just in terms of tremor capture, but in terms of their lives. So all of this stuff got better. Um, if you got energy, right? But if you didn't, it didn't get better. So that was great. And it seemed to be durable out through a year. This is very important. Speaking. Speaking got actually better with the thalamotomy. And we were all worried that we were going to cause dysarthria. And I'm here to tell you, you do get dysarthria. The fricatives are screwed up for about a week and a half to two weeks. I took the train to Topeka, Massachusetts General Hospital. Those things are hard to say for my patients. Um, and when it happens on the table, I do get worried about it and I move laterally. But look, we didn't hurt language, um, at least the, the, the fricative language. Um, and that's, we're going through that all over again now with a bilateral trial. Everybody said there'd be a 20% rate of permanent dysarthria and we just haven't seen it. So you can do a thalamotomy bilaterally. You can actually operate in the thalamus unlike what Walter Dandy said. But when you do so, you can make mistakes. And these have been swept under the carpet. And it annoys me, uh, it annoys Ron Alterman. And he put a really nice review, I think, that was a little harsh in the Red Journal, but it's true. We don't talk about the um, A&Es so much. And the reason we should is because we can learn something. We had a 40% rate of paresthesias and ataxia uh, in that trial. So I don't know if I sent um, 16 patients back to um, Mike Hayes or Alan Roper, who were my movement disorders neurologists um, um, that had um, ataxia and paresthesias, they're not gonna send me any more DBS cases. Um, we did wait a year this is at the three month mark. At the year mark, that dropped down to a 14% rate of paresthesia, but still a 9% rate of ataxia. And I'll tell you, those complications probably were mine. You know, I was really going towards RF lesion heat, which isn't what you want to do when you do this. So we've gotten a lot better at that over the years, but this is the first data during the first 76 patients. And there's a solution to this. The main solution is to say that they happen and figure out why they happened. So if you've got paresthesias, you were too posterior in ventral caudalis. And we knew we were too posterior because we were mapping in ventral caudalis, some of us at low energy. That was a bad idea because that, that predisposed ventral caudalis to a lesion when you moved up here and really blasted it. So, what I do now is I don't start even in VIM. I start up in VOP and I work my way backwards to a classic target. And if I have a hint of paresthesia, I stop. So I don't look for paresthesias anymore. I try to avoid it. And that's a way that you can get your paresthesia rate down to 
roughly 15% off the table instead of 38%, and down to about a 4% rate of paresthesias in the tongue, not the hands, in the tongue. Uh, I think you can get it lower than that with a few other things. Dysarthria is not to be worried about. There's not going to be any permanent dysarthria from a thalamotomy done with focused ultrasound. I thought that this 4% rate of paresis was totally unforgivable. How could you make somebody weak? But I found out it's actually really easy to do. And I think it's probably a lot higher than that because you spill energy over into the white matter tract really easily um, when you're out laterally. And in the folks who have um, larger ventricles, which is a lot of these people who are a little bit older, VIM gets a lot smaller. The white matter tracks pick up heat much easier than the gray matter tracks. So you got to be a little bit careful. I think that that 54 degrees necrosis that we talked about is probably significantly lower um, in, in the internal capsules or in the white matter tracts. But this is the part that's really the most interesting, this rate of ataxia, where to come from? What are we hitting? I've had unilateral arm um, ataxia, arm, not leg, okay? Um, I'm not sure exactly what we're hitting, but I think it's going too deep. I think we're underneath the thalamus. We're hitting the, um, the rubral spinal tract, um, I think. Um, so the solution to all of this, one, is to talk about it and to stay one millimeter or two millimeters above and in front of the classic stereotactic target. So again, the guys that made the mistakes were the theoreticians who were highly trained, not paying attention to their patients. So the whole field is learned, and um, Nier Lipsman has written the best on how to do this and how to avoid these complications. I just learned by doing it, by making mistakes myself. But if you've done enough, um, you can go um, uh, and not make these complications and have an understanding of how the, the, um, the uh, tool works, because you know the classic phrase. So we tried to take some of those lessons and apply them when I came to Miami Children's to treat pediatric brain tumors and epilepsy. And the theoretical idea for this was that there's no statistically safe dose of ionizing radiation. We know this, I think, pretty well from the studies that were done after the war in Japan. Um, at least in children, there's probably not a, a, a safe dose. And that's why we do the fast scans and all the ultrasound stuff to image those, those um, kids up. Um, we think it may be a safer alternative to or adjuvant to um, conventional surgery. So if there's that little bit of medulloblastoma in the corner there that you couldn't get to, is it worth opening it all up and going back in there? Or could you take that out with focus ultrasound? You, I'll tell you a couple of cases in a minute. Um, where we treated with lit and then we weren't successful and we went back and touched it up with focused ultrasound. And that's indeed how we started. Could we ever replace SRS with focused ultrasound? I think we can. Um, certainly we're not going to be able to replace all of ionizing radiation with focused ultrasound. But if we think about focused ultrasound with blood brain barrier delivery of chemotherapeutic agents, like Dan talked about, um, maybe, maybe we can push ionizing radiation uh, back to the dark ages where it probably belongs. So we started this uh, trial um, called the feasibility safety study using the Exoblade 4000 system in the management of benign centrally located intracranial tumors. I read that thing at a meeting, actually Henry Brem read it and he told me my time was almost up. The FDA helped us with this title. They helped us put together the um, study they lengthened the study by a couple of years in the follow-up. What I think they did was really good. And as I said, we got through that trial in, in 30 days. So these are not impossible things to put together. But Dan Curry may be right that if we go through the COG protocol route, that this could present a challenge. Um, but it, I think it's one that we could all take on as a, um, as a unified team and not worry about the regulatory stuff so much. Um, Dr. Nagazi, how much time do I have? Am I, should I just wrap it up? You have about uh, 18 more minutes or so, so keep okay. going. Well, let me go through the structure of the trial because it's important and it gives you a way to think about how further trials may be structured. The FDA wanted us to do um, uh, 
progressively younger cohorts. So the upper bound was set at 22 uh, because of some of the bylaws initially within the hospital. And we were going to go down to eight years of age based upon some work that um, Jim Drake's lab had done with focused ultrasound and Adam Waspy at um, uh, uh, sick kids. They realized that the acoustic window closes at around that time, but interestingly enough, reopens again when the anterior fontanelle opens. So, um, you know, uh, uh, Adam and um, Dr. Drake's group have really done a whole bunch of very interesting things on using focused ultrasound to, to, to break down clots in the pediatric brain for um, um, uh, in, uh, yeah, hemorrhage. Uh, but the FDA made us be safe. They made us do a cohort of three patients between 18 and 22, and that really limited us. We, we had a hard time finding those patients because of that narrow age gap. So it took us a little time to get off the ground. At least that was our excuse for a while. And then it did open up to 12. And I think we've done enough now where we're almost open down to eight. So we need to recruit 10 patients between the ages of 22 and eight, and we've done six. Um, in since 2017. So this trial's going a little slow, everybody, and folks like Dan um, are coming on board to help us, but so are some other groups um, that, that could help us. The adult groups could be doing some more peds. And um, I think what we need to do with this trial is rather quickly turn it into a pivotal trial. Um, I think our safety stuff is already there. Um, we haven't made very many errors. In fact, I think we've made much, much fewer errors than we made on the thalamotomy trial. <clears throat> so it's time to move on. I think we could also turn this easily into an epilepsy trial. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. <clears throat> um, ideally for this tri trial, the patient should be asymptomatic and show some growth velocity. The key is you wanna be able to treat something that is WHO1 looking, um, that you would consider doing surgery on. And I know that that may be a little rare and that's probably why we've had a little trouble recruiting. But this little thing is key and I put this in the trial. Prior craniotomy is okay. This was the first focused ultrasound trial where the skull could be cracked. And that really helped us out a lot because the first cases we did um, were rescue cases. So if, if you've got a pesky remnant somewhere that you don't wanna go after and it falls somewhere within that treatment envelope, which incidentally does include <clears throat> the superior part of the um, cerebellum, let us know about it. The bleed risks, or sorry, the exclusion risks are just broken into um, uh, certain types of risk, bleeding risks, um, hydrocephalus risks, and oncological risks. Um, um, I don't think I'll say a lot about those. Those are all in that um, FDA... Uh, um, clinicaltrials.gov identifier. This is our, our supposed home run case. Um, and it, I think it really was. It was a fun case to do and think about. 22-year-old girl with gelastic seizures that did not generalize on many anti-epileptic medications. <clears throat> also with um, oppositional defiant disorder, as Dan mentioned, they have rage attacks and she was maintained on a, um, an antipsychotic medication. We attempted um, a laser interstitial thermal therapy to, to cut this wide base off. I think we did a really great job because look, there's the laser cavity. And look how far out laterally we got, almost to the optic track, but she was not rendered seizure free. We thought that this little isthmus of tissue might be a problem. Um, we weren't sure. We talked with her a lot about it. We considered a repeat um, laser gamma knife. Um, and she was one of the first volunteers for focused ultrasound. So what we did was we targeted um, that isthmus. Actually, we were a little bit less conservative than that. We tried to cut the rest of the hamartoma off of the base of the brain. Um, for the aficionados out there, this is a beautifully shaped spot. It's round. It's centered where you want it. It's got sub-millimeter accuracy. We hit um, an average peak temperature of 59 degrees in this run, but look, wow, we got to 62 degrees um, there. So we 
did run the risk of some inertial cavitation. And I'll show you where we got that in a minute. But what we did was to start behind the thing and work our way anteriorly here up to the cavity and, and cut it off. It, and it didn't, it wasn't a short case. I mean, it took us, it took us, uh, I think, uh, 17 hours to do this case. But on the other hand, she went home um, the day after surgery. These are, all, these are some of the shots just lined up in a coronal section. And we started out laterally in, in tissue that we knew was good in that beautiful gray matter away from the ventricles. And then we worked our way medially. And, and as we did that, as we worked our way medially, we also worked our way anteriorly to do a true disconnection surgery. Um, and I've got a video here that helps you actually, I think, experience what we actually see during the, the procedure. Of course, the, the whole patient's there in, in a Lexell frame, but we stripped all that away just to leave the skull and the phased array. So there's all thousand drivers, half of them are cut off there, but there's half the skull. And here they're all aimed at one spot centrally. Notice how there is a lot of, a lot of, um, hay around there. I mean, these, these aren't super sharp, but nonetheless, the, the thermographic phased array map is right there and it's sharp and we can see it from run to run and even during the run. Here's where we got our acoustic cavitation. Look at that. That's a hurricane. That's a Miami hurricane right in the middle of the brain, about four times bigger than a standard thalamotomy. We didn't expect that. I think it was the money shot, but we wonder, and Dan wonders, how close did we get to trouble? I don't think we were actually all that close in retrospect. I think that actually helped us. And I think we might be able to use inertial cavitation to help us operate. But as of now, we're considering that stuff uncontrollable. And we reported that as a, an adverse event. But we got this case done. And she stayed, she stayed seizure-free now for um, almost over four years. Um, and she's off of her medications. And, and off of her uh, reserpidone. So uh, very quietly, um, Dan realized we've done some psychosurgery in children um, with, with, um, with this kind of epilepsy. So she did have one cluster where um, she came off of her um, anti-epileptic medications rapidly, but I think that anyone coming off of those number of medications rapidly is gonna have some trouble. So we're working on getting this case and a few others like it published. And we have a really fascinating one that I'm not gonna show you where we had a pedunculated hamartoma and we cut that off and the girl lost a lot of weight effortlessly. This is the most important case that I wanna show you though, cause it's a strikeout, it's a failure. 19 year old boy with tuberous sclerosis, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma with calcium flex in it. Not a ton, it's not egg shelled, but we worried about him. Um, and we took him because he was on Everolimus and he wanted to come off it. Um, um, can, can everybody see that? Or is that, am I projecting okay? Okay, good. Um, we were worried a little bit, I guess, about hydrocephalus, but he obviously didn't have any. But he was, he was taking his junior year in, in Germany. He was at a school in California. And together with the, the, the treating group in California, we decided to take this fairly cognitively normal child with uh, tuberous sclerosis to the OR to see if we could shrink that thing down and get him off of the Everolimus. At least um, uh, it won't be needed for that intracranial tumor right there. Now, Everolimus treats a lot of things that aren't just in the brain, or the, all the other manifestations in the brain. So we were a little bit hesitant about that as an indication, but that's what we did. Anyway, we struck out. Notice how that spot shape is no longer round, looks more like a kidney bean. Um, and it's, it's right there, it's right there, it's right there. We managed only to take out about this much of this tumor and it was near the ventricles and it was distorted. And we saw too often acoustic cavitation here. This is acoustic splatter around, this is the carrier frequency at 650 kilohertz, which is sharp. Sometimes you see a nice harmonic there, but I kept seeing splatter. I got worried about it, especially as we, as we neared that calcium fleck 
and I stopped. And that was a that's treatment failure. But that's a really, really important treatment failure. That defined what we didn't think we could be able to do um, with this device. And that's treat calcium laden um, tumors. Although it was also pointed out to us that we were close to the ventricle. So we may have been at a fluid fluid border rather than at a piece of calcium. Right now with the technology, you can't tell where the acoustic cavitation is coming from. Soon that will change. And we may try to operate near calcium again, but I think it was the calcium and not the ventricle because on those other cases, we operated right up to 0.5 millimeters from the ventricular wall and didn't see anything like that. Um, so these are the take home messages I wanna leave you with. Focus ultrasound is certainly capable of treating subcortical epilepsy unless the hippocampus is cortical, which it is. So I think we can take out the subcortical. Um, and those cases have been attempted successfully now, unpublished in Japan. Uh, focused ultrasound yields a highly conformal instantaneous lesion. Instantaneous in the sense that you can see it form. It takes you all day to do it because the thing is clunky, but it is a conformal way of doing thermal ablation, unlike an RF lesion, even unlike a laser. Even though we can move it, you can't steer it around like you can focused ultrasound. And that's pretty important when you're operating in the thalamus. Uh, cavitation, I believe, is likely near calcium. I don't think it's actually all that likely near brain fluid interfaces, but that remains to be seen. And we could test that out on tumors that have fluid pockets. Someday we will. Important message for children, no radiation. There's been no hemorrhage in 5,000 cases that have been done in the thalamus. Um, and I've done 500 of those and there, there hasn't been a hemorrhage and we haven't had an infection. Those two safety points really just don't get talked about enough. That's pretty important. You know, we're not doing harm with this tool, right? Um, we have the possibility to do harm with inertial cavitation, but then again, there's that theoretical mind raising its head with it, no practical world um, uh, evidence for it being uh, trouble. In fact, I think where we saw it, we, we actually saw it as help. So I don't want to be a Pollyanna. What I really want to say is you can't trust the theory. You just got to get in there and do it. And that's why we need this regulatory approval for PEDS. That's why we need to get done with this trial now. I'm glad Dan's here helping us out. He's always been there. Um, he knows the direction we're going to go. And if you guys have some um, cases you want to send Toba or me, um, give Toba a call. And then, um, and then um, she can call me on this number, Toba. And then um, the, what we really want to do is do an international pivotal trial with a minimum of five sites um, to get world approval for Pete's brain tumors, at least WHO1. And then they'll let us do WHO2. The DIPG stuff is getting off the ground right now um, with Toronto leading the way as they always do. I think we should do pallidotomies bilaterally stage for primary dystonia. At least we could do a unilateral, see how that goes. And then if we're brave, we could do a bilateral. And then if we're really brave, we can apply for the HDE from the FDA, just like they did for DBS um, to treat those rare conditions. I think epilepsy is the high ground. Uh, Miami Children's was always right to think about that and focus on it. There's so much to be done from knocking out the um, epileptic foci temporarily. I saw a really interesting study where they did BBB opening with propofol and the propofol stuck around for a couple days. That was fascinating. You had a block and then you could go back in there and take it out. All kinds of things like that I think could be done in the realm of epilepsy and change really the way we do epilepsy surgery because this stuff is really easy to do. It can be done anywhere, virtually by anybody. I think I've proven that. Um, being in the middle of a cornfield in Nebraska, right? They all come and we, we do that. So this technology is sophisticated, but it's so sophisticated it's easy to use. So it should change epilepsy surgery. I have my doubts about neural onc actually. I have my doubts about BBB, but I'm a skeptic. And again, 
I had huge doubts about thalamotomy for essential tremor too when I started this. So I'm prepared to be a skeptic and then I'm prepared to drink the Kool-Aid after I try it and see it. And um, some people may say I have, but I think everybody who knows me um, knows that it is hard to convince me that something is a good thing unless I see it for myself. So if anyone wants to come do cases with me, they're always welcome to come to, come to Nebraska City and, and, and do cases. I think that's really all I had to tell you, everyone. These are just some examples of some other things that Dan's already mentioned that you can think about. Um, more hypothalamic hematomas, uncalcified segas, the uh, perinodular ventricular heterotopias, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, um, as a way to at least get through the trial um, at, at Miami Children's. Th thanks very much for your time, everyone. That, that was great and gave, I think, everyone a lot to think about of potential options for use of this treatment and, and where the field may go in the future with this. Um, we're really hoping that uh, a lot of you on here will type in your questions, a great opportunity to have uh, discussion um, and answer questions. And while that's getting started, I'll ask a question. Um, you know, I think you talked a lot about um, how this technique can be used for ablation. And there's also a lot of discussion about uh, blood-brain barrier disruption potentially for tumor. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, for those who are not as familiar with the technique of how you can use ultrasound to do such different things and the differences in the technique between ablation versus opening the blood-brain barrier without causing damage and allowing it to reclose after delivery of drug? I, I can talk about what I know. Um, and what I've read because I don't, I don't have any experience with BBB opening. Uh, Todd Mainprize led the way um, in, in, in Toronto, you know, really um, a pioneering man um, did this, gosh, 10 years ago and was able to show that, um, I forgot the doxorubicin maybe was boosted by 400% within the uh, penumbra of the, um, blood brain barrier opening versus normal brain tissue. So Todd did focus ultrasound, went and operated, biopsied inside and outside, and was able to show that there's boost. That's great with that drug that's kind of not crossing the blood brain barrier too well, but what about temozolomide? Why would you need focus ultrasound for that? People are doing it, doesn't make any sense to me, but there's still a boost of one or 2%. I think there's probably a lot of drugs out there that don't get across the blood brain barrier that may not have been of interest to folks who are thinking oncologically uh, because they just don't get across. Um, Frank Yolas himself wanted to use um, the antibody against the breast tissue uh, uh, for METs. He, he thought you could open the blood brain barrier and let antibodies get across a little bit better and not have to operate on those things. So um, I don't know how it's gonna work out. Um, I'd be surprised if there's a home run in any of that blood brain barrier stuff, but, um, um, but it's not a surprise that I really wanna tackle. And that's for this very reason, you gotta do Kaplan-Meier curves and sit around and wait and then do all the statistics. And I'm just too impatient for that. I wanna see that epileptic focus go away and I wanna see the tremor stop. So. You know, I'm not as patient as most people. So the patient folks are going to be doing oncological things. And uh, Graham, Graham Woodworth in Maryland is a very patient person. And I think it's designed probably a really elegant protocol um, for blood brain barrier opening in the context of adult glioma. Of course, where we're all very, very interested in this in the PEDS world is DIPG, where there's nothing to do. Um, can we get the right drugs to the, to the, to the brainstem with blood brain barrier opening? And as you know, um, you've been thinking about this a long time. Um, maybe we can improve the survival um, doing it this way. But um, the short answer to this whole thing is, I don't know. I think it's fascinating, but I don't know where to go with it, I guess is the answer. And but before we transition to other questions, I'll, I'll segue that you mentioned DIPG. Our next Miami Symposium is actually gonna be focused on DIPG um, with Michelle Manji and Amanda Saratza speaking. Um, I'll share my screen to just put up the flyer. That'll be on uh, July 12th. Uh, some great work there on um, 
from Michelle Manji on sort of understanding DIPG and the biology, uh, as well as some new uh, potential therapeutic strategies. And then uh, Amanda Saratsis is looking at liquid biopsy uh, for DIPG. So um, that'll be great for our next session um, uh, while we're talking about uh, DIPG. So Travis, um, thank you for giving us this uh, this talk. Um, if you, uh, so I, I know you touched upon this a bit. So right now, this uh, you know the clinical trial that's going on here, it does it does not require uh, biopsy proven, correct? Um, if you could just run through that, just so that uh, we can get a handle on the types of patients that would potentially be candidates uh, for this group, and then. Um, and then the other question, so I'll let you answer that question. Then I have a couple of more questions for you. Okay. Well, I say they don't, they, they don't have to be biopsy, but it turns out like most of our patients were. So I think the remnant cases are ideal where you've got some tissue. Um, if, if you've got a Sega, we could try it again, you know, or, or you know, uh, of course a hematoma case, but Dan does all those. Um, so he'll get a machine, help us out. Um, but no, they don't have to be biopsied up front. Um, and could we make a mistake there? I suppose. But I also excluded all the WHO one things that bleed, you know, like um, a Cori plexus papilloma or something that I thought would bleed. Um, I don't think we should have limited that to WHO one stuff at all, but that's just what the FDA wanted us to do. But you shouldn't be afraid of that because you don't have to do the biopsy. They were just trying to make us be as careful as possible. So I think when we go to do the pivotal, we just should just open that up to pediatric brain tumors, period, and throw out all the pathological grading that has to be done after surgery. I didn't think it made any sense to put WHO1 into the title, but that's what they wanted um, because we didn't require biopsy. We didn't want to require biopsy. Liquid biopsy may be the way around this. I don't know very much about it. It sounds fascinating to me, but... Um, uh, should we be biopsying all these first? Probably, honestly, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's you know that's um, that's a you know a good question of you know how do you know unless it's obviously a Sega or a remnant how do you know it's definitively a who grade one? Um, and then uh, can you just uh, touch base and and let us know about kind of what's expected of the patients in terms of hair and that sort of thing for this uh, procedure? Because um, that seems to be a big deal for a lot of these patients that are going through this. So if you could just go through that so that, um, you know, if there is somebody that our audience members wants to send down um, to be considered kind of what's expected. So it's, it's not, um, you know, a, a strikeout the minute they walk in. Does that make sense? Well, there is some uh, expectation setting, I suppose. Do we really need to shave the head? Um, that's actually being debated at the moment. If you get enough, if you get enough degassed water in there, probably we'll get rid of all the air from within the hair follicles um, or between the shafts. Um, I'm tempted to try a few um, thalamotomies without a shave and just see what we get away with. Um, that would be considered off label, but I have, I've seen one scalp burn um, in the 500 cases I've done, and that was underneath the silastic membrane in a little acne pit that must have held up. It must have held some degree of air, and it burned okay. a little bit. Not a, not a second degree of burn or anything like that, but we've never seen anything on top of the scalp. So I think, again, that's all theoretical nonsense, and this cooling it to uh, 54 degrees Fahrenheit, that just freezes the patient out. I've stopped doing that. I don't understand okay. why we're cooling the skin when it's the skull heating up. And you know how vascular the skull is. Um, so that doesn't make sense to me. But it is true, you have to have a, you not only have to have a clipper shave, you, in, Inside Tech wants you to do a full razor shave. And I do do that. Um, the, it's, interestingly enough, it's been the women that have been the, the most okay with that because they they go to the they want to try a new hairstyle a new hair color they're more inventive they wear their silk scarves it's been the men um who have tended to um shy away from that because they they lose some of their sense of i think manliness when they're i, I don't know I, you know it's it's delilah and samson maybe sort of thing but there's some psychology around that 
I think if you spend the time talking to these kids, you know, we, we could probably talk them into anything as we usually do. So I don't think the shave is necessarily an issue. And in a young child, I think I'd consider doing it if I could get away with it under the protocol without shaving them. But we, we could discuss that with the FDA. Yeah. Okay. But shouldn't be, a, I hope it's not a showstopper in any one great case. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you coming and joining us today. Um, this has really been an excellent discussion, excellent talk, uh, Dr. Curry, uh, Dr. Tierney. Um, we appreciate it. And, um, you know, I, I look forward to seeing where we are 10 years from now with this modality, um, not only with epilepsy, but looking forward to um, the more malignant pathologies that we don't have options for, and we're putting these kids through surgeries. So it's an exciting time. And I'm looking forward to seeing where we go from here. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining, especially the two of you. And we look forward to seeing you guys um, next month um, for our DIPG discussion. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you everyone for joining. And we hope we'll see you on July 12th for some additional great speakers. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks to Bye bye to everyone. This concludes the Zoom posting for today. Have a good day.